Uh, if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 6. And um, as you turn there, just one more reminder. Um, we are going to be taking communion at the end of service. Um, and then also we'll be sharing a meal together at the end of service. And so we'd love to have you, uh, we'd love to have you stay and join us. And if you can't stay, we'd love to have you take some food. Uh, because this week there's a lot of people sick. There's a lot of people away. And so we've got a lot of food. Um, and so uh, take some, please. Because <laughs> as much as I like the hoagies from Christopher's, I don't want to eat them all week. Uh, so uh, so uh, please stay and eat. If you can't stay, pack, pack some. We've got to-go boxes. Take some, take some with you. So John chapter 6, this is our... Uh, I guess our second week or third week in John 6. This is our fifth week in this Life in the Spirit series, which I told you was going to be longer than we thought it was going to be. And every week as I prepare, the series gets longer. Um, it's either that or the sermons are going to get longer. So I've, I've decided that we make the series longer rather than the sermons. Because um, some would say the sermons are long enough as it is. Never. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, you know, it's funny. I preached somewhere else last Sunday, and Sunday, early Sunday morning, I was up preparing, and I got a text from Ed that said, I can't be there today, so let me just remind you, take your time. <laughs> and, and you ended it too soon. That's, there you go. Just to the there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Joey. <laughs> so here in John 6, we kind of started it last week, so I'm going to sort of jump in where we were. How does a miraculous meal turn into a tense discussion that ends with almost everybody leaving? Mm. Now, that might sound like some of our Thanksgivings. Yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah. But we are, we, are, we are talking about John 6. Jesus had fed the 5,000, and that group of people, after they had eaten, were so excited that they were ready to take Jesus by force and make him their king. But not only was it not time for Jesus to be their king, they didn't really want him to be king. They wanted him to do what they wanted him to do. In actuality, they wanted to take him by force and make him their servant. They wanted to make him the one who fulfilled their dreams, their hopes, and their desires. And so Jesus, as John chapter 2 says, knowing the hearts of men, he sent his apostles across to the other side of the sea, and he withdrew to the mountain to be by himself. The next day, much of that same crowd crossed the sea and they found Jesus at the synagogue in Capernaum. When they found Jesus, they said, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So Jesus was saying to them, you didn't see how the bread was pointing to me. You just want me to give you more bread. Even though they were chasing after Jesus, they were not being led by the Holy Spirit. They wanted to make him their king, but they weren't ready to serve his kingdom. They appeared to be following Jesus, but the truth was they were living in the flesh. So tonight, I'm going to ask a hard question, and then I'll repeat it a few times as we go through this together. It's a question that I know that we want to answer correctly, but I've been praying this week that we'd answer it honestly. Are we here for Jesus? Now, I don't mean here on 5.30 on a Saturday night. I mean, are we here in this stage of our lives, whatever that stage may be? Whatever our age may be, are we here at this point in our lives for Jesus? Are we here in marriage and in singleness? Are we here in parenting children or maybe parenting adults? Are we here in sickness or in wholeness, in happiness and in grief, in plenty and in want? Are we here for Jesus, is he the goal of our hearts, the desire of our hearts? Is he the captain of our lives? Are we here not because we heard that if we touched his garments, he might make us well, but because we have discovered and come to believe that he himself is our hope? Are we here not because we need more bread, but because he's the bread of life, that he's the greater man? Are we here because Jesus has become our heart's desire and not the one we look to to get our heart's desire? Mm -hmm. Are we here for Jesus? 
To start making some sense of John chapter 6, I think we have to go to the end of the chapter. And we'll get, it, we'll get to it in more detail over the course of the next few minutes. But after Jesus said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. John then wrote that many of his disciples were grumbling. So I want us to make sure we catch this. This is people that believed in Jesus. These were the people that were following Jesus. John describes them as disciples. So we're not talking about Pharisees and Sadducees. We're not talking about scribes and priests. We're not talking about religious people. We're talking about the followers of Jesus. They said, he said things that were hard for them to hear. Doesn't that happen to all of us? Let me ask it this way. Isn't that supposed to happen to all of us? If the word of God is living and active, it is, if it is sharper than any double-edged sword, if it pierces and divides, isn't it supposed to confront and convict and even sometimes offend us? Let's go even further. If the Holy Spirit who breathed the scriptures is supposed to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, and he lives in us, isn't he going to have to convict us before he can use us and use our lives to convict others? How can we live in a way that convicts the world if we're not willing to be convicted ourselves? The crowd of disciples, of believers, of people who were following Jesus grumbled because they didn't like what Jesus was saying. But remember this always, Jesus spoke not to please the crowds, but to please the Father. He said in John 12, 49, I speak not of my own authority, but I speak that which has been commanded to me of my Father. So the truth is, the hard truth is, Jesus wasn't trying to say things that made them feel better. Jesus was saying whatever the Father had put in his heart, in his mind, and in his mouth. And so Jesus was not measuring his ministry on whether people liked what he said. He was measuring on if the Father was pleased with his obedience. His word is supposed to cut us sometimes. Right, Daniel chapter 5, verse 27, when we, we've all heard of the handwriting on the wall where the king of Babylon was there and the handwriting's on the wall and he brings Daniel in to translate it and basically what it comes down to is this, you have been measured and found wanting. That's what the word of God is supposed to do in our lives on a regular basis. It's supposed to measure us and find us wanting. It's supposed to show us the places where we lack, the places where we're still disobedient, the places where we've not yet submitted, not yet surrendered, not yet yielded, not yet been changed. Because the word of God was given not to get us to heaven and not to be some instruction book. It was given to show us who God is and change us, shape us, conform us into the image of the Son. And so the word is meant to show us all the places we're not like Jesus and then make us like Jesus in those places. The Word of God is supposed to make us uncomfortable, not just make us feel better when we are uncomfortable. Jesus' response to their grumbling was, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending and descending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. So the statement at the end explains the discussion throughout the chapter. From the moment it started, it was a battle between the spirit and the flesh. It was Jesus trying to lead people to freedom, but their flesh trying to keep them in bondage. According to Galatians chapter 5, we're still in this battle. Day by day, hour by hour, sometimes it feels like minute by minute, where it's the Holy Spirit living in us, fighting against the flesh, and our flesh fighting against the Holy Spirit. Listen to Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, before we get to verse 17, I want us to notice that the emphasis is on following the Holy Spirit. It does not say, fight against the flesh and you will walk by the Spirit. Our effort is not supposed to be on the negative, but on the positive. Our effort is not meant to be on defeating our flesh, but on following the leadership and knowing the voice of and yielding our hearts to the Holy Spirit. Many of us are trying harder and would want to do better, but in some ways, all we're doing is giving the flesh more power because our focus is still on ourselves rather than on the spirit who lives in us. 
How many times have we said to God, I'm trying. I'll never do it again. If you forgive me this time, I won't do it again. We've made plans. We've worked hard. But all we've done is stare at the problem rather than lift our eyes to the hills from whence our help comes from. There is a point where, yes, we have to acknowledge and confess our sin, but we have to be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We're never going to be whole by looking at ourselves. But if we would learn how to look at Jesus through the Spirit, we would discover that He is our holiness. Verse 17 then says, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So let's wrestle with this tonight. How do we know the difference between the leadership of the Spirit and the control of our flesh? See, a question I'm asked often is, how do you know the difference? How, how am I supposed to know the difference between the voice of God and the voice of the enemy? Before we can figure that out, we've got to learn the difference between the spirit and the flesh. I've got to learn the difference between how God leads and how I want him to lead. I've got to learn the difference between what he's promised and what I'm grabbing hold of. I've got to learn how to lay myself down, right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Anyone who desires to come after me, what's the first thing you have to do? Deny yourself. Well, if I won't acknowledge that this is my flesh, I'm never going to deny it. In fact, I will try to use God's name to get my flesh everything it ever wants it. <laughs> and that's where a lot of us live, if we're honest. We still want God to be the one who answers every request, who meets every desire that just is giving me the life I always dreamed of, rather than the life that he created. We have to learn the difference between the leadership of the spirit and the control of the flesh. At the beginning of John chapter 6, when Jesus saw the crowd, he said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people make it? John wrote that Jesus said this to test Philip because he already knew what, was, what he was going to do. So the plan was already set. Jesus was following the Father, not the crowd. He already knew what he was going to do. But he invited Philip into it because there was something he wanted to do in Philip. And there's something he wants to do in us. Let's remember we're talking about thousands of people. Not a few. We're talking about thousands. Philip responded 200 denarii, and a denarius was about a day's wage. So Philip's basically saying 200 days' wages worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. Now, if you've got it open, notice something with me. Jesus didn't ask how much it would cost. He just asked where they could get what they needed. Last week, we said that the flesh stirs feelings and raises questions of lack, that every time we have that panicked feeling of not having enough, that it is the flesh at work. So let's add on to that. The flesh attempts to answer questions that were not asked. Most of our what-ifs are the work of the flesh. So Jesus was testing Philip's faith, but Philip was stuck in his flesh. How do we know this? He was looking at the size of the crowd. He was looking at the great cost of the bread. He was focused on everything. Everything but Jesus. Isn't that where I live way too often? I'm not even making it about you. Isn't that where I live way too often? Ed just prayed perfectly for the building because don't we sometimes go to the building and say, are we ever going to get this thing done? It's, it's too big. It's too much work. It's too much this. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough labor. We don't have this. We don't have that. We're often looking at something God gave us as if it is a negative rather than the gift of God. We're often looking at the need rather than the giver and the one who holds all things in his hand. That's when we know we're in the flesh. When something God gave us becomes something that takes from us in our minds, we're in the flesh. So instead of Philip saying, wow, Jesus wants to feed the crowd, Philip says, there's no way we have enough money for this. Philip's not the treasurer. He doesn't know how much money he has. Remember, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth and that he would glorify Jesus. Anytime we are in any situation where we cannot remember God's character, when we cannot trust his love, when we will not deny ourselves to follow Jesus, 
we know we're walking in the flesh. Because that's what denying ourselves is. It is just fighting against our flesh. It's not saying, I don't deserve to have anything good, or it's not, you know, to a vow of poverty. It's when we get in that place where we're saying, but that's not what I want. But that's not when I wanted it to happen. But that doesn't seem fair. Why am I the one that always has to repent? Why am I the one that always has to sacrifice? Why do, am I the one that always has to this or that? That's always the flesh. Always. At the beginning of John 6, Jesus is trying to invite us into the Spirit, but most of us aren't even willing to acknowledge that we're living in the flesh. You know, this is probably a good time for us to try to at least a little bit define the flesh. The Greek word just means literal and actual flesh. It's all it means. It means the meat that's under your skin. That's, that's all it, it, it means. So it, it doesn't have some great Greek meaning where we can, you know, take it apart. It just means the flesh. But we have to look at how it's used. It's always used for what we like to call our humanness. But what I believe the scriptures want us to see as our fallenness. Yes. Where we say, I'm only human, and the scriptures are trying to say, but you're not meant to be. The scriptures are trying to say, but Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, is the one who has come and filled you with his spirit that you would be conformed into his image. So don't settle for fallenness when you've been invited into redemption. Amen. Don't settle for weakness when you've been offered strength. But the hard part for us is strength in the kingdom of God comes through the denial of self. And we're still fighting that. Andrew Murray in The Indwelling Spirit defines the flesh as our fallen nature, both soul and body. The flesh, again, is what a lot of us call just being human. It's every part of us that hasn't yet been surrendered to Jesus. It's every part of us that hasn't yet yielded to the Holy Spirit that we still believe we are in control of, but in truth, it is in control of us. Uh, you know what? The, you, we are welcome to split hairs on this. The flesh is everything that's yet to be born again. It's everything that's yet to be born from heaven. And I'm not saying that salvation happens in stages. When we are saved, we are saved. But we are also being saved. And so while my name is written in the book, my heart has not yet been fully changed. And so the being changed is what we used to call sanctification. It is this work and this process that God is doing in, in, in our lives. In every one of us, no matter how long we've been in Christ, no matter how much we've given to Christ, right now we have parts that have yet to be born again. That's the flesh. That's the flesh. But it doesn't have to be. Meaning we don't have to keep living in those places. We are choosing all of them. See, this is, the flesh is the part that God wants from us, but we some, for some reason, have kept for ourselves. It was Abraham's fear, Jacob's deceitfulness, Moses' anger, David's pride, Solomon's lust, even Elijah's self-pity. It's the thing that causes us to question God, to do things our way, or to blame others, or blame circumstances. It's bondage. And the flesh itself isn't sin, but it leads to sin because it's at war with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The flesh is always trying to put the focus on us mm -hmm. for one reason, so we won't focus on Jesus. Mm -hmm. So often in the Bible, what we have are converses. Life and death, blind and seeing, those. the converse of the Spirit is the flesh. So that means if the Spirit, if Jesus said the Spirit will always glorify Him, so what's the flesh going to do? Always turn us from Him. Mm -hmm. And how does He do that? By focusing on us. Mm -hmm. See, the flesh is smart enough, the flesh understands that we're not going to curse Jesus, that we're not going to deny Jesus, and so what does He do? Think about you. Talk about you. Make it about you. Always make it about you. Because here's the thing. When it is about me, it's not about Jesus. No matter how much I argue, no matter where I throw in Jesus' name in there, it is not about him because I've made it about me. The flesh is whenever I go outside of glorifying Jesus because I'm trying to satisfy myself. Philip responded from the flesh. The question in his mind was useless because it didn't matter where they might buy bread. They didn't have enough money for that much bread. But Andrew 
spoke up, apparently without being asked. <laughs> Andrew spoke up and said to Jesus, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? So Andrew is showing us the battle between the spirit and the flesh. Right? Because the first part speaks up, says, there's a boy here who has five loaves and two fish. That's the spirit. Jesus, here's what we've got. But then the flesh sneaks in and says, yeah, but, but just in case. <laughs> just, just in case. What is that? Just in case. So, so you don't have to tell me that's not nearly enough. I'll say it. Just in case. The flesh is always just in case. The flesh hedges our beds. The flesh, the flesh is what throws in. If the Lord will. Not because we're really submitted to the will of God, but because just in case he's not going to do what I want him to do, I want to sound like, <laughs> I want to sound like I'm, I know what I'm talking about. Andrew probably didn't even know that he was being led by the Holy Spirit, but he spoke up and he focused on Jesus. He was even honest enough to say, what I have is probably not enough, but here's what I do have. He didn't reject the situation because of his discomfort. He did not send the boy away because his lunch was not enough. He spoke up. He put what he had in Jesus' hands. He joined Jesus in what Jesus was doing. Andrew had no idea what Jesus was going to do, but he decided to join Jesus in whatever he decided. He put his life and his reputation in Jesus' hands. In this simple test, can we see the difference between being led by the Spirit and by the flesh? Can we see the difference in trusting Jesus and not trusting him in faith and in doubt and denying ourselves or following Jesus? Can we see where our flesh might have a bigger grip on our lives than we've been willing to admit? Can we see that we don't need more of the Holy Spirit? We need to give the Holy Spirit more of ourselves. The crowd ate and got excited. And got excited, excuse me. Now, for all of my excitable friends, give me a little leeway here. But excitement is a great cover-up for immaturity. We get excited about things and we jump into them without counting the cost, without thinking them through, without really getting a lot of direction from the Lord. I believe that it, excitement is one of those strong stirrings of the flesh. Here's what excitement often looks like when it's in the flesh. We start things, but we don't finish them. We have great ideas, but if if no one else gathers around those great ideas, we just kind of set them aside because no one wanted to help. When the truth is, maybe it just wasn't a great idea. See, the spirit leads to endurance, but the flesh just always pivots. Always pivots, always changes, always, well, maybe it's this, well, maybe it's that, well, maybe it's always got an explanation as to why I wasn't wrong, it's just it meant this, or it's supposed to be that, or again, it's blaming someone, or the timing, or this other thing, if, if, if you know, if my wife would just get herself together, if she would listen, if she would be led by the Spirit, if this, if that, it always moves away from me being the issue, so that I don't have to deal with my flesh, because the flesh does not want us to deal with it. Because it knows that the Spirit makes war against it. The crowd wanted to make Jesus the king. They were excited in the moment, in the flesh. They went looking for him the next day, and when they found him, Jesus didn't applaud them for coming. He confronted them about their motives. He said, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. They had come to be fed rather than to feed on Jesus. They had come to be satisfied rather than finding their satisfaction in him. They came to get what they wanted, not because they wanted him. They were being driven by the flesh. And so I'll ask us again, this place you're in in your life right now, are we here for Jesus? Jesus then said to them, do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God has set his seal. We talked about this a lot last week, so I'm not going to repeat all of that. But we are all guilty of spending much of our time, our effort, and our lives on things that don't actually matter. I think that's also one of the greatest identifying marks of the flesh. It's when we have hyper-focus on things that are out of our control and promise to be in God's hands. How many of us, honestly, are worried about things tonight that God has promised that he would take care of? 
How many of us are worried about things, are anxious about things, are losing sleep about things, or have that pit, in the, that, that pit in our stomachs about things that we know I have no control over this. God has to. God has to. He has to not bail me out. He has to do what, he, what he's going to do. He has to move. He has to work. He has to answer. This is what Jesus was confronting in Matthew chapter 6 when he said, Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, not about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Let me ask this tonight. What if abundant life, the abundant life that Jesus said he came to bring in John 10, 10, isn't an abundance of the flesh but an abundance of the spirit? What if he came to give himself abundantly, to show us the Father abundantly, and to give us the Spirit abundantly? What if abundant life isn't anything that will perish? What if it's not the things of our, fle our flesh keep saying that we need to be happy? What if abundant life is trusting him? What if abundant life is when we trust God with our lives so that God himself becomes our life? And you may say, yeah, but we need food and we need jobs, we need homes, we need spouses, we want children, our children to be healthy and happy and safe, we want to be comfortable. Jesus answered all of that as he kept going in Matthew 6. He said, for the Gentiles, and remember, in these contexts, the Gentiles mean those who don't know God. Those who are living in death because they have yet to be resurrected to life. Those who don't know God, they seek after, meaning they work for, worry about, and live for all these things. And your heavenly Father knows you need them all. I'm not saying we don't get anxious. I'm not saying we're not going to worry. I'm not saying that somehow we're just going to go through life like everything's always great. Jesus said, when, why did Jesus tell us not to worry about tomorrow? Because, it, because today's got enough trouble as it is. So Jesus isn't saying, there's no trouble. Jesus is saying, trust me. Learn how to combat your anxiety. Learn how to fight your fear. Learn how to work through your stubbornness and your anger and your disappointment. It's not that you're going to avoid them by being in the Spirit. It's that the Spirit will lead you through them into truth. Jesus' point here is that God knows what we need. But do we know that we need him? And so he's calling us in this place to live for him, that he is the food that endures for eternal life, and to trust that he will provide what we need. And so I ask again, are we here for Jesus? And the things we don't have, are we confident that we have Jesus? And the things we're waiting for, longing for, looking for, are we overlooking that we have Jesus? Because those things somehow have shaded his goodness, his glory, and even the, the miracle that he cares for us at all. From there in John 6, they, they went into this short discussion about manna. Jesus said, for the, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, sir, give us this bread always. Again, what we see, they wanted bread. They were still following their flesh. They still didn't believe. It was the classic, yeah, but... Right? Haven't, haven't we all been in that situation where we suddenly are reminded or someone reminds us, but God's been good. Yeah, but this thing hasn't changed. But God's for you. Yeah, but I still live, don't have this. The flesh is always questioning what God has done with things that we think God should be doing. Jesus answered by saying, I am the bread. Why are the issues so often about food? Right? It seems a little silly, but if you notice how many problems arise around food in the Bible? In the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve access to eat from every tree of the garden except one, which means they had plenty, their needs were met, God had provided abundantly, and they focused their attention on the one tree that God said they couldn't eat. So we like to say Adam and Eve were perfect, and what they were was sinless, but what we learn as we really start to look at the scripture as a whole, they had flesh. They had flesh just like you do, and just like I do, which means they had desires that were, that were bent toward themselves rather than consecrated toward God. And so they had everything except one tree, and where did their attention go? The one tree that they couldn't have. Points to perceived lack. 
The flesh always points to something that's missing, something that's good, and that we don't have, something that's being withheld from us. So the question, like, I'd like us to change the narrative a little bit. So what did Satan come and attack? Their flesh. See, temptation cannot put something in you that isn't already there. Here's, here's the illustration I always use. Temptation is not seed, it's fertilizer. Meaning, temptation can't make something grow in you that hasn't been there before. Temptation will fertilize whatever you've been trying to hold down or hide. That's why the scripture said, it's why Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Your words reveal what's living in you, so does our temptation. Don't we all have things that are tempted? The person next to you is tempted by it doesn't bother you at all. And yet, then there are things... There are things that you're tempted by that the person next to you says, I can't even understand why anybody would want that. <laughs> so guess what the temptation is going to not be? What doesn't bother me? Right. I, just, I just tell you, like for me personally, I've never had a drink. Never wanted a drink. Never been interested in a drink. You know what I've never been tempted by? Drinking. It's not so. I, I've never had a sudden urge to pull into a bar as I'm on my way home. Like, it's <laughs> never ever happened. Why? Because it's not in me. But there is stuff in me. And, there, and those, that stuff that's in me, I've had sudden urges. I've had times where my mind seems to go to places like, how could it be there? Why would it be there? We're all the same. But what we need to understand is if you're experiencing temptation, it's because there's some fleshly part that has yet to be healed. Temptation is not sin. Temptation tries to lead us to sin. So don't be ashamed of your temptation. Be bold about it. If I'm being tempted, there's something in me that needs to be put to death. There's some flesh that needs to be dealt with. There's something I need to be working on and acknowledging and confessing and submitting to God. Don't hide your temptation. That's the surest way to fall into it. But if we deal with it head on, spirit to flesh, we might just overcome it before it ever even gets a chance to overcome it. The enemy attacked their flesh. Their focus on, he, he attacked their focus on the one thing they didn't have rather than the abundance that they had been given. So the original sin is what? Based on food. Food of all things. Esau traded his birthright for a bowl of stew. His birthright, I don't think any of us realize, or you know, we know, we know mentally, we don't understand the depths of a birthright. His birthright meant that he had leadership in the family clan for his entire life and a double portion of the inheritance. He traded it for one meal. One meal. Israel panicked when they ran out of food and then they complained when they got tired of the food God provided. The flesh tends to make our most base needs our most dominant desire. That's why it's often about food. It questions the goodness of God's leadership and tempts, even taunts us to grab for ourselves what we want and what we believe we need. Now, we live in hindsight, and we're looking from a distance. We know what we know, and we think how foolish some of these things sound. Like, like, we look back and we, we basically see Adam and Eve going, you know, God walks with us in the garden. He's given us dominion and access over all of his creation. But it's just not fair that we can't eat from that one tree. It's ultimately what it came down to. The problem is it's what it comes down to for me. I want to know what it tastes like. I wonder what, he keeps, keep, what, what he's keeping from us. They chose food over the presence of God. Israel was walking in freedom from slavery, living with God's presence in plain view. They had walked through a sea on dry ground and drank water that was made sweet by Moses throwing a log into it. Think about that. Like, if you throw a log in my water, I'm not drinking it. That's how, that's how God healed it. This is all that they'd seen God do for them, and suddenly they were convinced, once they ran out of food the next time, that they were going to die. They completely distrusted God when their flesh got hungry. But what have they learned from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3? It was God who caused them to hunger. It was God who created the hunger. He created the tension so that he could feed them with something no one had ever seen or eaten before. He took the food they craved to give them food that he had created just for them. Like, this goes over my head most of the time when I read it. Think about that. He, he, he withheld what they craved to give them something he created just 
for them. If he had given them what they wanted, they would have never known manna. They would have never had manna. You may say some of them didn't want manna anyway. But that's, that's, that, that's, again, our flesh getting in the way of the spirit, of God's heart for us, God's plan for us. Manna was more than food. Manna was a sign of relationship. But go further, not just to, for Israel, but to any of the other nations that might have been watching. Have you ever thought about this? The other nations watching Israel? This is a people that get bread from heaven every morning. This is a people that have no food and they're well fed. This is a people that go to bed at night and when they wake up, there's bread on the ground for them to eat. We shouldn't mess with that people. Right? Like, we don't think of the witness of the manna. We just think, wonder what it tasted like. <laughs> As my fitness instructor, nutritionist friend Cheryl often says, most of us get killed by our taste buds. <laughs> because we want food to please us, rather than understanding that our pleasure was always meant to be found in God. Every day that the manna appeared, it was a reminder of God's love and God's care, of God's nearness, of his goodness, of his character. They didn't just eat bread from heaven. They were eating the goodness of God every time they had a meal. Moses said that every day it was an announcement that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God took their food to teach them that he would always be enough. He is creating our hunger because we have not yet learned to trust him, to be satisfied in him, that no matter how difficult it gets, we don't have to lean on our understanding, our talents, our abilities, or our past efforts. We can lean on him. And for some of us, he has to take all of our strength until we finally say, have your own way. But then we get to Numbers 11. So now they've been eating manna probably for a little over a year. Then they've been eating, eating manna. They eat it every day, but they get, they get it six days a week. And the mixed multitude, which those were the non-Israelites that had left Israel, with, had left Egypt with Israel, it says that they had a strong craving, and together with Israel, they began to weep, meaning they cried over this. <laughs> Remember when your toddler used to cry because you made something they didn't want you to make, or, or, or somehow the macaroni and cheese was touching the chicken nuggets, and now that made them completely inedible? This is now a nation weeping because they were tired of the bread that appeared from heaven every morning. And before we say that's crazy, we have done some weeping over things that God gave us but we didn't want. They, started, they said this, oh that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. <laughs> remember when your mom would bring out the big pot and it meant that you were eating that all week? Like whatever, whatever she made in that pot, and then that's what you're eating all week long. Have you ever gotten to the point where you're just like, I can't even look at another bowl of soup? That's where it should have was. Because they, they said we can't, they didn't say all we have to eat is this manna. They said, but all we have is this manna to look at. Guys, the flesh creates cravings that become complaints if we're not consecrated to God. Not only do our complaints cause us to grab for ourselves, but they also anger God and they grieve the Holy Spirit. Just put that in your backpack. We're going to get to that in a couple of weeks. If you haven't been going through the reading plan, go sit down with Numbers 11 through 14 and just see how our complaints affect the heart of God. See how they roll off of our lips easily, but they find deep places in the heart of God. There are two things that I want us to see that are signs that we are living in the flesh rather than in the Holy Spirit. And these are going to be kind of difficult, but follow me. Number one is our relationship with food. And number two is our response when things don't go the way we wanted them to go. Our cravings and our disappointments reveal if we're living in our flesh. You know why gluttony is a sin? We've made it about taking care of the temple of the Holy Spirit. I don't think it has anything to do with that. 
I think gluttony is a sin because it's feasting on the gift rather than the giver. Food is good. It is a gift from God, but it's supposed to make us give thanks. Why are so many of us still praying for God to bless the food rather than thanking God for the blessing of the food? Why do we think that God made us to need food? It was not just to create dependence upon him, but to teach us that he is dependable. I know this might sound crazy, but it is good to enjoy food. But the enjoyment of our food is supposed to cause us to enjoy God even more. We're not supposed to binge on food. The food is supposed to satisfy our bodies so that our souls will abound in the goodness of God. Enjoy a good meal, but enjoy it by thinking of how good God is. That even our fuel tastes good. That even our fuel is provided by Him. That He is so good to us that He didn't just make us to need to eat. He then wanted to feed us. Man, that's, to me, that's so powerful because we still live so much of our lives trying to please God rather than realizing God wants to please us. But here's the problem. A lot of us are hard to please. I know I am. A lot of us live again in that yeah but place where we still are never quite satisfied. I know it may not seem as, a, as miraculous to you and me, but every meal we eat should produce just as much thanks to, to God in us as the gathering of the manna did for Israel. If Adam and Eve had rejoiced over the God who had given them every tree in the garden, they may have never craved the one tree that God had forbidden. They might have just trusted him rather than chasing their creed. An unhealthy relationship or a longing, a craving for food is a sure sign that we are living in the flesh. What was the first thing that Jesus did when the Spirit came upon him? The Holy Spirit drove him to the wilderness to fast for 40 days and prepare for temptation. And what was the very first temptation? If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Feed yourself. You don't have to crave. You shouldn't have to be hungry. If you're the Son of God, why should you endure hunger? Some of us are still struggling with that same place. Why can't I have what I want? Because we were created to desire God in the way that he desires us. So the next question is this, how do we respond when things aren't the way that we wanted them to be or they didn't go the way we expected them to go? How do we handle disappointment? Do we explode? Do we just go inside, shut down? Do we try to control and manipulate others with our emotions? Maybe the biggest one is, do we become dramatic? These are all sure signs that we're living in the flesh. When Israel got to the Red Sea and saw the Egyptian army behind them, they prayed to God, but then they complained to and complained about Moses. And listen, they had a reason to be afraid, right? Like this was a fearful situation. There's an army coming after them. They're not an army. There's water in front of them. They don't have any boats. Like this is a situation that was worthy of fear. And they did the right thing when they called on God, but then they did the fleshly thing when they complained about Moses. And they said this, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us to the wilderness to die? Let me share this with you guys tonight. Our complaints are undermining our prayers. For a lot of us, our prayer lives are suffering because we are not taking control of our complaints. We are using our tongues in blessing and cursing. And the scripture says, brothers and sisters, this ought not be. And understand, in scripture, cursing is not saying bad words. Cursing is speaking against God. It's complaining. The things we're saying about our situations are eroding our faith and our trust in God for the situation. But the scripture says, make no room for the flesh. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. Bring all your requests to God, but at the same time, speak life. Magnify the Lord. Remind yourself of his character and preach his goodness to your heart. Psalm 34 that we read earlier starts this way. That his praise would be continually on my lips. I will bless the Lord at all times. Go back and mark that in your Bible. All times and continually. So that means bless the Lord when you're 
disappointed, and when you're angry, and when you're hurt, and when you're grieving, and when nothing is the way you wanted it to be, bless the Lord. Let his praise be continually on your lips, because if it is, there's no room for complaining. There's no time for complaining, because I have chosen to be one who praises. Israel ran out of water and thought that they were going to die. They ran out of food and thought they were going to die. They heard there were giants in the promised land and they thought that they were going to die. And yet none of those things killed them. But they didn't get to the promised land. Because they never crucified their flesh. They never followed the Spirit. They never trusted God. They never feasted on God's goodness. They continually complained. And it was their complaints that kept them out of the land. Jesus said that the Spirit gives life, but the flesh is of no good at all. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 says that the desires of the flesh result in death. We will talk about more next week what that might really mean. But for now, let's identify the flesh in our lives so that we can surrender it to Jesus in repentance and walk in the Holy Spirit to life. Go back to John 6 with me and we'll start to wrap this up. The crowd came looking for more bread from Jesus, but Jesus said, I am the bread of life. They were in the flesh. He was in the spirit. They were making it about food. He was making it about their hearts. The religious leaders then argued with Jesus and he said again, I am the bread of life. But then he added this hard saying, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Their response was literal. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus doubled down on that. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So, so often we say that this was Jesus introducing communion. And, and maybe we can draw that, but I'm going to be honest, that, that's a hard line. Like, like it sounds easy, but when we look at a lot of what's going on, there's so much more happening. First of all, it's Passover time. That's what the beginning of John 6 tells us. So, so I do want us to see the lines that Jesus is drawing. It's Passover time, but it's at least a year from the Last Supper. So that we're going through the calendar another time before we get to when Jesus finally says, this cup represents the new covenant, which is in my blood. So Jesus was preparing them for him for his death. He was preparing them for him being the Passover lamb. He was getting them ready to understand that there was more to this than they had grasped so far. I believe that what Jesus was doing was setting the stage for them to understand that in him, Deuteronomy 8.3 was finally being fulfilled. This was where man was finally going to be able to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is where their hunger would be satisfied. This is when all of their waiting would be fulfilled. This is when the purpose of God was being fulfilled in Jesus, but for the people of Israel, so that it could be fulfilled for all of the nations. I believe Jesus was trying to show that the manna kept their bodies alive, but he would give them eternal life. That the manna got them through wilderness, but he would usher them into God's kingdom. He was trying to teach us to crave him more than food, to feast on him and stop living for the things that perish and to live in him, to live for him, to even live with him by living in the spirit who would come to live in us. It wasn't about you need to take communion so that you go to heaven. It was an understanding. I am the greater manna. I am the bread of life. The father will always take care of your body. Your spirit needs to come alive and yield to me. Because the flesh is good for nothing at all. So Jesus was not getting us ready for communion. He was teaching us how to live. Be satisfied in me. Trust in me. Find your joy in me. When it, I believe that it's all an illustration that, again, it will eventually point to communion. But communion doesn't matter if I haven't yielded to Jesus. Communion doesn't matter if, I, if he's not my satisfaction. Communion doesn't change me. The bread and the wine that we drink tonight, it won't change any of us. It won't save any of us. But if it turns us toward him, then that's the purpose. He was saying, feast on me. Find your satisfaction in me. Let all of your life be found in me. It's 
I have to ask us tonight, are we living from the flesh or living in the spirit? Are we living for ourselves or living for Jesus? Are we living in our craving and complaint or in contentment and trust? Are we feasting on Jesus? Are we here for Jesus or do we just want Jesus to be here for us? Just in two minutes, Veronica and David will come back. And we'll prepare ourselves to take communion. But be reminded that Jesus gave this to the apostles again during the Passover meal. So this is one Passover in John 6. And then as we move ahead, we get to the next Passover where Jesus gives them the, the communion as part of the Passover meal as a symbol of his death and resurrection. Communion is not feasting on Jesus. It is a reminder to feast on Jesus. He himself said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So as we eat and we drink tonight, we're calling ourselves to greater dependence. We're calling ourselves to greater devotion. We are remembering the cross and remembering the resurrection. We are remembering that the Holy Spirit lives in us and that Jesus has promised to return for us. But the remembering is calling us to crucify the flesh. When we eat and we drink tonight, we are challenging ourselves. We are saying, remember the cross and don't follow the flesh. Remember the cross and walk in the spirit. Remember the cross and be set free. Be born again. Be made whole. Communion is a calling to repent of our complaints and to rejoice in his good. All things without grumbling and complaining might be one of the most difficult commands that were given in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And yet, the more we actually read the Scripture, our complaining seems to be the thing that God takes to heart the most. Like as you read through the Scriptures, God's moved when Israel complains. Parents, aren't you? Like when your children complain, doesn't it? Like doesn't it move you? Like doesn't it? Sometimes it makes me angry. Sometimes it grieves me. Sometimes it hurts my feelings. But it, it affects me because here's the thing that we have to remember. And, and as we go through it, and again, go back to numbers and spend some time in it because Ed talked about it tonight. We've been talking about it in, in the in the uh, Bible study group. Um, it has affected me all week long. There's this thing that they they complained about food. Mo, uh, Aaron and um, Miriam complained about Moses' wife. Um, they complained about the, the kind of food. They complained about what they didn't have. And every time God said, they're complaining about me. So tonight, as we prepare to eat, Veronica, you guys can come. As we prepare to eat and drink, when we just sit during this one song and ask the Holy Spirit to show us all the places of complaint, Show us all the places where we give the flesh far more room than it deserves. All the places that we have yet to yield to the Spirit. And then let's repent of those places. And never forget that when we, you know, He is faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so repentance in these moments are not times for guilt or shame. They're times for freedom. They're times for hope. Their time is to be changed. And so as they lead us in this one song, we need to search our hearts and ask the Holy Spirit, show me the places of my flesh that need to be laid down. And then I'll come back and lead us in communion.